Yeah, I got the fancy pants OLED monitor. I bought it from Micro Center. Let's unbox it, take a closer look. It's got one flaw that I know of. Will there be more? I don't know. PG32UCDP. So definitely not my first rodeo picking up ROG OLED monitors. This one is 31.5 inches, 32 inches. If you have good eyesight, 32 inches in 4K, you can run 4K at 100% scaling or 125% scaling if you're into scaling in Windows, and that looks pretty good. My second favorite size for OLED is actually 42 inches. 42 inches at 100% scaling is really nice, especially if you have weaker eyesight and you're gonna sit a little farther back from your display. But if you have good eyesight, the pixel density here is comparable to 2560 by 1440 on a 27-inch display. It's just, this is 4K. And OLED. OLED really is the promised land for everything computer display. I mean, it should be, right? Because this is like a twelve or $1,300 monitor. Meanwhile, the state of gaming monitors in 2024 is you can get a thumping good gaming monitor for on the order of $250, $300. You know, 4K, high refresh rate, but the panel technology is not OLED. And this comes with a three-year warranty. See, the problem up till now with OLED has been that OLED wears, it ages. You can get permanent burn-in. But it turns out everything else is made so cheaply that it's probably going to die anyway, too, right? I mean... But with OLED, because each pixel is its own point of emitting light, well, actually three points of emitting light, it looks gorgeous. Absolutely fantastic. So Asus is spending lots of extra money that they didn't need to on a nice cloth bag with accessories. You know what I would have rather had, Asus? DisplayPort 2.1 support. Is he hinting at the flaw? I think he might be. All right, in our cloth bag, we have our fancy pants power cable. We have a HDMI cable that does not need to be in an anti-static bag. It's an ROG themed anti-static bag too. We can't just use that common swill that you would have mass produced somewhere. Uh, it's another ROG cable. This appears to be a DisplayPort cable. Another ROG anti-static bag. None of these need to be in anti-static bags. USB type C and USB A to B, five gigabit. And that's all that's in that bag. Over here we've got Warranty card information, a calibration profile. Now this actually, this is something that could be worth the price of admission because this being an OLED, it's gonna have fantastic color space and everything like that. And some of this is just gonna be a matter of certifications and everything else. So this is 97.2 of the sRGB color space and this display has been factory calibrated. And this is what the factory calibration looks like. And we can see that this printout corresponds to, I guess this model or this, this, this thing. See what else we've got in the paperwork department. Welcome to something something. Yeah, I know OLED is nice. They really, they really want to make you feel feel good about your purchase. I mean, OLED really is nice, but the fact that you could buy two really nice 4K gaming monitors, maybe even three really nice gaming monitors, upwards of four really nice 4K gaming monitors for the price of this one monitor, uh, it does sting a bit. At the rear I.O. we've got the DC input port. It does have an external DC power brick. Two HDMI ports, those are HDMI 2.1. DisplayPort 1.4, a combo type C port, which can do 70 watts of power delivery. USB type B input port. And then we've got two USB 5 gigabit type A ports. Another type A port 5 gigabit that can do 1.5 amps. A headphone microphone port and optical SPDIF out. This monitor also has a standard 100 millimeter Visa mounting option, which I will be using. Also comes with a suite of ROG stickers. The power brick is heavy. It is a 20 volt, 14 amp, 280 watt output. Keep in mind that 70 watts of that is allocated for being able to charge your laptop. This monitor does have a built-in KVM, so you could plug in your desktop gaming machine and your work laptop to the monitor and plug in your peripherals to the monitor and be able to switch between them. Spoiler alert, I know a thing or two about testing USB hubs. Those are not always perfect. They haven't been perfect historically on ASUS monitors. See also my review on the 42 inch. We're gonna put this one through the test and see if it works. Maybe, maybe not, we'll see. A lot of the time people try to use devices like the Focusrite i2i, devices that have a lot of quirks. ASUS doesn't really do a lot of USB device testing or put workarounds in their uh, hubs to deal with quirks and everything else. And so when you're doing switching, this is basically a glorified USB switching chipset. And so it'll probably work for standard-ish peripherals, but if you have slightly squirrely peripherals, the 
KVM switching functionality as it is built into the monitor is somewhat lackluster compared to what I do in dedicated hardware. But what I do in dedicated hardware is vastly more expensive. So, I, you know, there's a trade-off. Still, ASUS could put a little bit more work in the firmware and probably get it into a better spot. Well, it certainly is a fancy Republic of Gamers stand. Yeah, they put a lot of engineering into the stand in order to be able to do lights and everything else. There's two gold pogo pins here. You gotta be careful not to damage these because this is what makes the electrical connection to the monitor. Also in the box, you've got these little glass lens things, which you can put in the bottom of the monitor stand because it projects a little image onto the thing. We'll look at that in a second. Excellent. This is the 100 millimeter Visa adapter bundled right in the box with a quick release. So this is very, very nice to see. I might be able to modify this to use my own pogo pen adapter if I want to use a monitor arm with it. I have to remember to look at that. Wow. This is the lightest OLED panel. Usually because the OLED is so uh, high performance, there's a lot of metal in here that they use as a heat sink to dissipate heat, but whatever black magic ASUS is doing, this really doesn't weigh very much at all. I also like to see how much packing they've, they've put on this. This is great. And yes, of course it is FreeSync and G-Sync. They paid a little bit extra to have it fully officially G-Sync certified. Ah, oh, there's also a threaded mount at the top of the monitor stand to hold a webcam or a video thing or a light or something like that. Standard like you'd find on a tripod. Interesting. As fancy as this stand is, guess what? It doesn't rotate. If you want to run this display in portrait, you're gonna be building your own arm. Asus cheaps out on the weirdest stuff. Would you say that you found the monitor review appealing? Pro tip, when dealing with ASUS for warranty, you really want to save all the original packing. So you might as well just put it all back in the box exactly the way that it was so you can remember how to put it together if you need to send it in for warranty service. Sometimes you can talk them into mailing you the box too. Ooh, fancy pants, gold-ish, gold-ish plated looking-ish. A lot of the cool features for this monitor are hidden behind the on-screen display. So this will show you that you're running at 240 hertz and if it's in, you know, right now it's in racing mode, so it's a little b brighter than usual. But you do have options here like AI Shadow Boost, AI Sniper, <laughs> MOBA Map Helper, which, uh, you know, depending on your point of view, could be cheating basically. AI Shadow Boost lets you see what's in the shadows, you can turn your contrast up. AI Sniper and uh, MOBA, like things are going to get highlighted on the display to help you be a better player. It's interesting. Variable refresh rate, free sync, adaptive sync, and G-Sync compatible is on by default. You can also turn on an FPS counter and a bar graph and some other useful things here to see how your display is doing. There's also this display alignment thing which will help you if the display seems misaligned on the OLED panel. To prevent burn-in, there's some features here where the display can shift things very slightly or, you know, burn-in mitigation technologies. I'm not really sure how that works in this display because ASUS doesn't disclose that, as far as I can tell, at least in any of the press material that they sent after I asked for it. So, I don't know. Maybe check the forum thread on that. The monitor also has built-in pixel cleaning, so if you do notice some burn-in, you can execute the pixel cleaning and that will help. And this is no different than an OLED TV or anything like that. This is not something that I've had to run, but maybe once a quarter, once every six months, on other OLED displays that I'm using like five, six hours a day. It just helps with image retention and before things become more serious than burn-in. A lot of those kind of features you can find under the OLED care menu on the OSD. Definitely check out the manual and some information online to learn about the care and feeding of your new OLED display. ASUS can run this display at 1080p 480Hz. I think this should work with DisplayPort 2.1 at 480Hz in 4K, so I really think ASUS missed out here. Maybe this is why it doesn't require a heatsink and it doesn't have to be heavy. But 1080 at 480 hertz, that is your option with this display if you want to run that. You gotta set it in the OSD. Fortunately, they make it easy. There's a button you can hit that will let you do that. RGB subpixel layout. Frame boost, what does that mean? It means the display is gonna run at 480 hertz at 1080p. I really think that 
Asus could have put DisplayPort 2.1 on this to be able to run at 480 hertz, basically across the board, 4K, 1080p, doesn't matter. But as it is, you can make a button so that you hit between 1080p in game boost mode and 4K at 240 hertz. But 4K at 240 hertz, fine. Now, in terms of the LCD testing, like response time, everything else like that, the panel itself is actually faster than the input. Like the physical pixels here can respond faster than the inputs to this. The thing that slows this down is the electronics. The electronics in the display, 240 hertz is not fast enough that the pixels on the display could actually go faster, which is completely nuts. Absolutely bananas insane. Ligom.nl, when you're looking at the tests there for panel quality, mind-blowing quality and it's because of the OLED. This is basically the promised land of the monitor of the future except maybe in a 5 or an 8k configuration for really amazing pixel smoothing. But let's face it, display scaling really doesn't work super amazing on, on Windows or Linux, either one. So 4k, 100% scaling in Windows, 32 inch, that aspect of it. I mean that's true even for non-OLED displays. But the fact this is OLED and it has pretty much all the boxes ticked, even the color space and everything else, I would not be surprised if Netflix approves this monitor for professional work because, yeah, it's that good. Actually puts some of the Asus ProArt monitors to shame in a lot of respects. And it's a, it's a gaming monitor. Now in terms of KVM features, check this out. We can plug in our framework laptop, connect it with USB-C, and our framework laptop will use its USB-C cable to charge, but it'll also send USB and display signals to the monitor. Now, because you're using display and USB over the same wire and it's not Thunderbolt, your display resolution and refresh may be a little bit limited. If you want to run 4K, 4K 90 hertz, you can achieve that, but 4K 120 or 4K 240 with the USB 5 gigabit, uh, it's not really a great idea, don't do that. In terms of USB device switching, if I wanted to daisy chain something like my System76 keyboard, that's actually a 10 gigabit keyboard, that's not a good idea. This monitor seems pretty unforgiving of daisy chaining a USB hub. So the USB hub in my System76 keyboard to use for peripherals or local storage or anything else doesn't seem to work all that well. It doesn't, it's not that it doesn't work at all, it's that it does work, works at 5 gigabit, but it doesn't work super amazingly well with all the other kinds of peripherals. As expected, a device like the Focusrite Scarlet i2i is a little problematic with this monitor it would drop out and connect and drop out and connect not unreliably like you couldn't set your watch by it but it would do it just enough in testing that it was annoying uh, most other usb peripherals did work logitech and everything else worked pretty well note that if you're going to have a wireless receiver you really probably should use that on a simple usb extension because the front of the monitor seems to block rf signals a little bit and having the little receiver thing up here and behind a piece of metal and your mouse over here not great in terms of signal integrity if you have a mouse pad that does signal reception you could plug that into your monitor and that probably work okay and the importance of plugging your peripherals in terms of USB into the monitor is so that you can use it for input switching. Now because the HDMI is 2.1, if you're using this with a console like an Xbox or PS5, I don't have either one of those consoles, but I can tell you the USB 2.1 ports on this work perfectly. If you're on Linux, you shouldn't use HDMI for reasons that you should understand because you're on Linux. But for a console, that can work really well. And the console can work for input switching as well. So when you switch over to a console, the console will work. You, you don't need a keyboard and mouse on a console. It's just switching the display. Oh, no, you got to wake up. So it is possible to use an Xbox or PS5. Now, a fully loaded configuration, you're going to use both of the HDMI ports plus DisplayPort for your gaming computer plus USB-C for your laptop. And you're going to switch bef between four inputs. Well, the KVM function will let you do that between USB-C and DisplayPort. And then you can manually pick one of the two HDMI inputs, not using the USB switching for that. And that will work but the experience in the menu is a little clunky. There might be a way to do that through Asus control software. It does support Aura Sync, and so like if you're doing the RGB thing, you can make the RGB on the monitor uh, roll with whatever the RGB that you've got going on on your computer. If your computer is somewhere you can see the back of the display, you can do fun stuff with the back of the display RGB. It is a neat aesthetic. And listen, I'm here, I'm all about OLED displays and OLED goodness, and my goodness, OLED. I mean, the price, it is a premium, but it's like putting butter directly into your eyes in the best possible way. 
I'm Bundle, this is level one. This has been a quick look at the Asus, the ROG Swift OLED PG32UCDP. It's definitely not Asus's first foray into OLED monitors, and it definitely beats the pants off of the uh, OLED offering directly from LG. LG does not know how to make a gaming monitor. It's sad, but it's true. The other monitor that I want to take a look at is the uh, the Aorus OLED. Similar panel, maybe the same panel with different electronics. Different setup, fully display port 2.1. It at least has that going for it, but I haven't gotten hands-on with that monitor. Look for a comparison for that soon, as soon as I can find a deal on that other monitor. But this, you would not be unhappy with this monitor. This is a very nice monitor. It feels like a $1,200 monitor, and I definitely cannot say that of other non-OLED monitors that I paid for. Another way that you might want to look at it, LG was the first, you know, OLED gaming monitor. It was a $3,000 monitor. And that was just like a year ago. This monitor is a third of the cost of that one. It's over $3,000. And it beats the pants off of that OLED monitor directly from LG a couple of years ago in every way measurable. It's pretty good. All right, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. Let me know if there's anything you want to see, test, do, whatever. I'm going to put this on my desk here at the office. For now, this is the display I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna use it with our Visa 100 millimeter mount. It would have been nice if Asus included screws. I don't think they did. Cause it's uh, kind of a thick mounting situation we got going on here. But I'll double check that box and make sure. All right, I'm signing out, I'll see you later.